Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, for the Psychosocial Research Workshop. I'm Kim Cantor. I'm an uh, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Researcher at Newmore's Children's Health in Delaware, where I also um, have the pleasure and privilege of being the psychologist with our CF team. Um, uh, Chelsea, my co-presenter, was not able to be here in person, but um, was super, super helpful in getting organized, so I want to give her lots of credit for this, too. Um, and won't take up too much time. We have a really stellar lineup of presenters. Um, it's really exciting for me to be moderating this session. This is one of the very first sessions I remember attending at my first NACFC and just being so impressed by. So um, we have a really impressive, amazing group of speakers. Um, just the only housekeeping note is um, if you have questions for the presenters, we're going to do questions right after each presenter finishes their talk. So please use the Q&A in the app. I'll be checking that throughout. And if, if time allows, we can also take questions from the audience. Um, and our first speaker today um, is, is Dr. Quitner. So she's going to come on up and get us started with our presentations. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so delighted to be here and present on the National Implementation of Depression and Anxiety Screening at USCF Centers and talk to you about what predicts success in implementation. I just want to mention that if we, uh, lots of people have come up to me in this conference, and if we look at the conference program, it's quite amazing to see mental health now all over the program, so many amazing sessions on mental health that if you, even without the data I'm going to present today, you might say, we've been very successful in integrating mental health into CF care. And just think about what that means, that we have a very complex chronic condition in which we are actually, in routine CF care, integrating mental health. So I think it's a really a remarkable um, contribution, and it's really been the work of many of you in this room and people at this conference. I'd like to acknowledge the incredible Mental Health Advisory Committee research group that worked on this presentation and on these data. They're a really amazing group to work with. Okay, so... I'm going to try. Okay. I have really nothing to disclose. I'm the chair of the subcommittee for the Research Mental Health Advisory Committee. So just some early background. Um, we had an early implementation survey of 1,454 providers in the EU and the U.S. prior to the publication of the mental health guidelines. And what we learned from that was that 20% of CF teams had no one with a primary mental health role at all on the team. 73% had no experience in mental health screening, and people were using 48 different screening tools, which meant that we really couldn't gather data, we really couldn't compare across programs. Following the publication of the guidelines, which many of you worked on, and I have to thank all of those people who worked on the guidelines committee, we had incredible successes when we measured the first year of implementation, and that was published in Pediatric Pulmonology. So the, the CF Foundation, as you know, awarded 84 grants to fund mental health coordinators. So I have to say one of the things that helped us launch mental health screening was this outer setting to change health care was the support of the CF Foundation. And that's a really important thing when you think about a CFER consolidated framework for implementation model. So we had 84 programs, and after a year, 100% were prepared to screen and discuss results with people with CF as well as parent caregivers. And we identified some of the key barriers, time, logistics, follow-up, and sustainability was a huge concern. So I'm going to present now a longitudinal study of three years of implementation across three cohorts. Our aims were to generate longitudinal implementation scores. So you might look at this conference, the amazing CFCBT training that so many people attended, the DBT workshops today, and say, wow, implementation is a huge success. But I would love to quantitate and uh, document those results. So we generated these surveys that mental health coordinators completed each year using the CIFAR model, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. And we also wanted to identify the variables that might predict implementation success. So we looked at things like type of center, pediatric versus adult, 
size of center. Maybe larger centers have more resources than smaller centers, and they'll do a better job at implementation. And then we looked at the years of experience of the mental health coordinator. Did that make a difference? Their experience working in CF. And finally, we wanted to use mixed modeling to look at the longitudinal success of those three cohorts over three years. So, you, as you know, those competitive grants were awarded between 2016 and 2018. So an important thing to kind of keep in mind is this is all pre-COVID data as we sent out our surveys and collected data. And we had 138 programs in the United States that were funded. And so each cohort is up there in terms of their N, and we had about an 88% response rate. So all, some of you in this room actually helped us collect these data, and I thank you. The mental health coordinators completed these surveys that assessed the CFER levels of implementation. From very basic, you have the right screening tools, PHQ-9, GAT-7. You know how to score, interpret, and discuss the results up to much more complex implementation tasks, like providing interventions for people in the severe to moderate range of anxiety or depression. And finally, we became very worried about sustainability because at three years, those grants began to drop off and we were worried about losing our workforce, our wonderfully trained clinicians. Points were then assigned to the survey questions based on a consensus discussion of our co-authors. And this is a beautiful representation of the model by Dr. Sonia Graziano. And you can see at the very basic thing, it's preparation, telling our stakeholders, our people with CF and parents, sending them a letter about screening and the purposes, up to those more difficult things, planning for suicide risk, developing referral networks, providing interventions in the mild range, and then all the way up to that final level, sustainability and long-term planning. This just shows you how we scored this from level one to level five so that we could empirically rate the success of implementation. And it just gives you some really nice examples. Billing, financial plans were really difficult and came at that last level. So first of all, the great news is we looked at the center characteristics across all these cohorts and found no statistically significant differences between the characteristics of the pediatric versus adult, large, medium, small, and across those cohorts, how long the person had been in their role. This allowed us then to collapse across these cohorts for our analyses because there were no differences in those characteristics by center. So here are our implementation scores over time. And if you look at that top line cohort one, what you see is that their score doubles from year one to year two, meaning their success and implementation is outstanding. Then it increased even further in year three. And we see a similar pattern for cohort two. They go from 23 points up to 41 points. And then we see that even cohort three is starting a little bit higher because they've learned from the tools, the educational materials, and some of the conference presentations that we've scheduled as a result of these mental health coordinator grants. So the great news here is we found statistically significant improvements in implementation across these cohorts across time. The other thing we wanted to look at is the predictors of change. So what accounts for whether you're successful in implementing or you're less successful? So again, you can see the cohorts. We use mixed modeling, and it, it's not related to whether you're an adult or pediatric or combined center. It's not related to the size of your center. But what it is related to, a significant predictor, is the time you have spent on a CF care team. So you, you people on CF care teams really matter in terms of your experience, comfort, experience with mental health issues. And the predictors were if you were one to five years or more than five years in a CF center, that predicted better implementation over time. So this is really interesting and I think teaches us a lot about how important our mental health staff are. This now models every single center in the study. These individual spaghetti plots show their implementation scores over time. And what you see is that solid line that shows that implementation improved over time. And you see some centers are just skyrocketing with implementation. But overall, the centers are generally all improving in terms of implementation, mental health screening, as well as providing interventions. And I think that's a key. So we also looked at barriers across the cohorts and years, and I think this is really important, I think this is pre-COVID. 
So people were worried about patient burden, time and availability for screening. And one of the things that happened with COVID is we moved toward more of a telehealth model, and some centers began to send a link so that you could screen electronically. So even though COVID was quite a, a difficult time, there were also some wonderful things that came out of COVID that helped us access patients easily and perhaps provide more mental health interventions. Space limitations, so screening an adolescent separate from a parent was difficult. Some of those logistics and limited staff time. And actually, these barriers continued. I mean, these are the common barriers we find in our healthcare systems, and it's very hard to solve some of these. It's hard to make your center bigger. It's hard to find space at times. Then we also wanted to rank order successes, and I'm so proud of these. Early identification of depression and anxiety. And think about how important that is. If we catch somebody earlier, that may prevent them from going on to have a chronic episode of depression and anxiety. We may be able to do more preventative approaches. So that's a wonderful success improved access to psychological services and interventions. And we've seen in this conference that we've been training everybody in these wonderful evidence-based interventions like DBT, CF-specific CBT. We are giving our patients and our providers, our caregivers, more access to psychological interventions. And it turns out they really prefer to access psychological services in the clinic because it can be very hard to access that in the community because of co-pays, lack of insurance, and the fact that providers may not understand CF. So the fact that we are giving access to psychological services is just a wonderful outcome of this implementation study. Increased awareness in the team. And this was really helpful actually during COVID when some of the mental health coordinators said they spent time helping with burnout and helping with the emotional stresses of COVID among team members. And then reduce stigma. So it's okay to come to clinic and talk about mental health concerns. This has really changed the tenor of coming to clinic. It's changed the dialogue and communication around emotional functioning and made it normalized. And it's okay to feel stressed or sad or worried. And I think for me, that's probably one of the most satisfying changes that I've seen. So the clinical implications are really important. The majority of CF programs, I congratulate you, made substantial improvements in implementation. This is really a tremendous success story. Some of this improvement I have to credit to the Mental Health Advisory Committee because each year we ask mental health coordinators, what would you like to see at the next NACFC? What skills would you like to learn? What kinds of handouts can we help you make for maybe kids with ADHD or other kinds of resources that we could make available? And they worked really hard to produce those materials. So I want to thank the Mental Health Advisory Committee for all that work. Implementation's ongoing, and we still need to get better. It's an ongoing process. It's very important to think about the predictors of success of implementation, and that was the experience of the mental health practitioner and the team. We need to invest in our workforce and our training of mental health clinicians, which I think we've done a really good job this year in doing that. Recently, there has been a lot of turnover in social workers and in other members of the team. So we really need to invest in retraining and perhaps going back to some of those basics of screening and having a discussion. We recently published with our EU colleagues uh, a survey from e the EU and the US on both people with CF and caregivers. They viewed mental health screening as an intervention in and of itself as a way to show caring and concern about the whole person and about how they're functioning. The one thing they were concerned about is that either they weren't offered screening and they were disappointed, or there was no conversation after the screening. They didn't get to talk about their results. So one of the things we learned in this study was how important that discussion and that feedback is, how much they want to talk to you after the screening to discuss the results. So it's important to provide that feedback. And then finally, people with uh, CF and families now have access to evidence-based treatments that are specific for CF, such as the CF-CBT trial, which we just trained people on, amazing training with like over 80 people, with a huge dissemination implementation trial now funded by the foundation, and the CALM intervention study with CJ Bathgate. These are amazing additions to our toolbox. And so future directions, I like to dream big. We were just at a plenary about dreaming. So it was 
tithes, the tithes data were uh, presented in a plenary in 2015, if you might remember. And we all dreamed someday we would have mental health integrated into CF care. It was just a dream at that time. And then look at where we are now. So here are my long-term dreams. Um, one of them is to work on adding mental health screening scores to the registry. And that's a grant that we're working on, Dr. Georgiopoulos, Smith, et cetera. And um, they're going to build a new platform for the registry. And wouldn't it have been amazing had we had PHQ-9, GAT-7 before Trikafta and then after Trikafta to look at some of these mental health side effects? Um, looking at the relationships then we could look at between mental health symptoms and health outcomes. Increasing our accountability for doing the screening. Looking at potential side effects of modulators in the mental health domain. We're hearing a lot about that. And evaluating the efficacy of mental health interventions. Okay, another dream of mine is a TIDES 2.0 in which we could do an epi study of children under 12 and get some prevalence data on the frequency of anxiety and depression in our kids under 12. And of course, another dream is to update the guidelines to look at those children under 12 and identify the best tools. And then finally, continuing to be able to, pro to provide psychological services using evidence-based treatments. And I must thank the people who, this has taken multiple villages to make this work, and lots of you in this room have made it happen. But I want to thank the mental health coordinators who filled out these surveys every year, gave us such great feedback and information, and provided the data for this study. Members of the Mental Health Advisory Committee who developed all these beautiful education training materials. The CF Foundation, who helped us in this outer setting level, larger systems level, get us started with these grants, and now have a line item that pays the salary of a mental health coordinator that identifies a role in every CF care team, all of them, all accredited, non-accredited, for a mental health practitioner. And the really maybe the CF community, which has said we want to prioritize this, and the ongoing support of people with CF and their families who think that this is very important. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Quidner. It's really incredible to see all of this work. Um, we've, we've had a few questions coming through the app, so I'll pose those first. Um, a couple questions actually about the mental health coordinator's experience and that, that significant relationship that, that you presented. So. Um, the first question, I'll, I'll say them both, they're, they're related. Um, whether it, this was considering length of time in the field in general or specific to the CF team. It was really how long you had been on the CF team. And so if you were on it one year or up to five years or longer, that was really a significant predictor of implementation success. So people who were brand new, who had just been hired, for example, with the Mental Health Coordinator Grant, but had no experience on a CF team prior, that was not a group included. But the groups that had been on the teams more than a year up to a longer period of time, that was very predictive of implementation success. And that makes sense to me. CF is super complex, and integrating mental health into CF care is, is a pretty tall order. So that experience was very helpful. So we want to keep our mental health practitioners. We want you to be satisfied in your role. We want to expand your role. And, and it's key, I think, to maintaining this integration of mental health. That's, that's great, and um, you actually preemptively <laughs> answered the related question, which um, was about whether those years of experience are perhaps a proxy for something else, um, why you think this was predictive of success, anything else about that? You know, I think, I mean, I've been working in CF for more than 30 years, and I think, you know, you become part of a team. It's part of a community, and you become embedded in a team. You learn a lot about the people with CF you're treating, the, the parents, the families you're working with. And it really takes some time just to be acclimated to the complexity of CF. It's also a moving target. I mean, when I think about my first work in a CF team as a graduate student, CF was a completely different disease. Look at how treatments are changing. The kinds of comorbidities are changing. So, you know, I think that experience really represents um, comfort with the disease, with the treatments, and sort of the complexity of CF. Um, since it affects so many domains of functioning, and uh, I think that's really important. Great. Um, 
A question about, you know, going down to a younger age range for screening and how important that is. Um, are there tools that you would recommend for that age range? So this is a really tough question. Yeah. So, you know, there are some, uh, two papers that are absolutely wonderful. Um, in pediatric pulmonology, I would point you to Dr. Anna Georgiopoulos wrote one of them, and um, Mary Beth Grimley wrote another one. Mary Beth, I'm sorry. Or, sorry, she got remarried. Um, she got married. Um, both of them wrote this wonderful paper on emotional wellness in, in younger children. They also did a, a 365 short course, which I thought was amazing, on emotional wellness in, in younger children. Um, we also have a chapter coming out in a, a famous respiratory textbook by Kendig um, in which we're reviewing all the tools. We know that the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out with recommendations for treating depression and recommendations for anxiety screening. There is a recommendation to use the SCARED for anxiety, but we all know that it's quite long, so there's concerns about that. There's been discussion about the PROMISE tools. So I think we're at a point where we really think it's important to take a deep dive into what are the best tools, what's practical, pragmatic for us. But I think it's also time for us to say that we're willing to tackle uh, mental health, that it's important to consider that in younger children. And I, of course, as a researcher, would love to get a grant to do a big epi study and look at the prevalence of anxiety and depression. The, your, our European colleagues would love to do it with us. Our Australian colleagues have brought it up. And I think that there are centers in the U.S. who would love to do it as well. So I think stay tuned. We have to build support for this. But um, just acknowledging how important it is to begin to address mental health and our children under 12, I think, is a first step. Great. And one, one more question. I think you set it up well. A, a question and a, a pitch, I think, to include Canada in Tides 2.0. Oh, I table? would love to. So you know I did try to include Canada. And, you know, I, I actually, what I did is I wrote the grant, and every country took my grant and tried to get funding. And unfortunately, the person who wanted to be the Canadian representative at the time um, really had trouble following through. And so... That's why Canada, um, it didn't get funded in Canada. And Australia, she tried many, many times. And at that time, the Australians weren't ready to deal with mental health. But they have come a million miles since then. And they are pushing us to think about a Tides 2.0. And they already think that they would have funding to be able to do Tides 2.0. So stay tuned for that, because we would need your help if we do that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Quitner. Okay, so next up we have uh, Dr. Georgiopoulos presenting about um, a qualitative cont content analysis of CF community and uh, provider survey data. And I have one other follow-up discussion point on that uh, as another stay tuned. It's part of the um, project to consider how best to update the CF patient registry, there will be a survey of mental health coordinators asking questions like, what are you doing for screening in, in younger groups? Um, lots of other kinds of things. So I really, you know, I know we're all so busy. It's so hard when those emails come through and we're in the middle of something else. But when you see that, which will not be for a little while, um, but once you see that, please do fill it out because that will help us um, inform, you know, what the best practices might be going forward. Okay. So, but I'm going to be speaking about uh, CF mental health research priorities um, and, again, qualitative content analysis of a CF community and provider survey. Oops. Now I can use yours. Yeah. Okay. So, um, these are my disclosures. Um, so we know that mental health is among the top three research priorities of the CF community. Um, and there'll be some interesting data tomorrow. I encourage you um, to see Arika von Sitter's um, uh, talk about uh, wellness survey in the Trikafta era. And we see that mental health rises also clinically to the top of what people see their needs are um, in this new era. Um, and so back in 2020, there was a CF Mental Health Research Priorities Working Group, which was a group that met for two workshops in 2020 and 2021 to try to designate what would be the areas of focus for CF mental health research. Um, and um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details of, 
of what came out of that because you can see that um, online. If you are uh, thinking of doing some research in CF Mental Health, please take a look. It's not meant to be prescriptive. So if you have a wonderful, innovative idea and it's not on this list, it doesn't mean you shouldn't apply. You, you know, you definitely should apply. But this will help kind of trigger um, folks who are reviewing grants to say, wait, you know, this is something that really we know has risen to the top based on um, a comprehensive look at the literature and multi-stakeholder workshops and also a survey of the CF community um, and CF healthcare providers. And so this is what I'm going to be talking about today. We did a mixed method study to elicit broad input to inform this work. It was a 22 item survey that was sent around by email and social media to CF healthcare providers. Um, some of those may have been you. Thank you for participating if you did. People with CF, family caregivers, and other members of the CF community um, back in June 2020. Um, and we have presented um, at ECFS some quantitative findings, um, but we aim to also analyze some quantitative findings to add depth. And so since um, not everyone may have seen the, uh, the talk at ECFS, um, I wanted to just briefly cover this as background. This is some of the quantitative results. So what you see here, um, the red uh, circles represent the CF community parents, people with CF, um, other caregivers, immediate family members, um, CF Foundation staff, people who lost a loved one to CF. And in blue circles, that represents um, CF healthcare providers. And we see really a very high degree of concordance. If you look at the um, top six lines, there's really not much difference between community members or providers in the top six um, priority areas that they mentioned um, when they were given a set of predetermined um, categories and asked to, uh, asked to say how important they were. So anxiety, depression and other mood disorders, effects of mental health conditions on the physical health of people with CF, effects of treatment burden on mental health, understanding risk factors and the prevalence of mental health concerns uh, and conditions in people with CF, and the effect of CF on family dynamics, um, family unit, family planning, parenting, um, kind of in aggregate. But we did see some difference um, as uh, in some of the other items. In particular, providers were more likely to select substance misuse or disordered eating as uh, priorities that they were noticing, and community members were more likely to select topics uh, including side effects of CF treatments, uh, PTSD or trauma, uh, grief, and survivor's guilt. So I'm going to move on now to the main focus of the topic today, which is the qualitative analysis. Um, and we had a really fantastic team of researchers, but most importantly, the predominant members of the team were um, six members of the CF community, who you see here. And it was really a wonderful process to be able to work with them and uh, I think really enrich the work. Um, so there were three open-ended questions as part of this survey. Um, the first was, when we're thinking about research topics specific to mental health, where are the current gaps in knowledge that should be prioritized for future research? So that was at the top of the survey before you saw, you know, any of these kind of pre-selected items that might be, you know, seeding ideas. What are, what are your own ideas spontaneously? At the end, we also asked, is there anything else regarding mental health and the needs of the community you would like to share? And also at the beginning of the survey, this was, remember, this is early in the COVID pandemic. And so there was a lot of worry about, shoot, we've been planning this, and then how is COVID going to confound this? And so I don't know how realistic this really was, but to say, try not to think about COVID, we said at the <laughs> beginning, like, pretend that's not happening. What are the priorities, right? And so then at the end, we asked qualitatively, considering the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, are there additional mental health topics that aren't covered by the survey questions? Um, and Beth uh, Smith has presented those results already. So we're going to really focus on um, questions one and two. Okay, so I'm going to take you a little bit through our methods of how we did the qualitative coding process. Um, so we had quite a few responses and, um, you know, some people had a lot to say. They had more than one idea about what a priority should be. So this is a good example of this. So um, what you see here, these three boxes are all the exact same thing. I'm just pulling out highlights there of different pieces that we kind of, that we broke up into different snippets. So um, there was a provider who, for example, in response to the question are, what are the current gaps in knowledge, said, mental health interventions for children and adolescents that target stressors that are specific to living with CF. They also pulled out uh, an idea that interventions to help patients manage chronic pain that are CBT-based, so multidisciplinary management, including non-farm treatment, 
um, would be important to research and also alcohol and substance use. So those things are different and we thought those should be split up. And uh, we created a quite detailed code book um, that included a hierarchy because we wanted to make sure because we were going to have three coding teams that we were um, designating the kind of general code in a consistent way um, so that effects of modulators, if that was mentioned, that was going to rise to the top. Not that the other things wouldn't be included, but that would be kind of priority one. Mental health conditions and, and disorders, screening, assessment, and intervention, systems level barriers and facilitators, and then living with CF. Um, so we would have a general code and then as many specific codes as we needed to. So role and life changes, for example, might be a specific code for living with CF. And then population, so if it was late diagnosis or setting, if it was an inpatient setting, we need more research. So this is an example to show you how that would be broken down. So this is a community member response to, is there anything else you'd like to share? And they said, I think it would be interesting to look at the role of parenting, particularly when children are young, and how that impacts expectations for the child to live a normal and full life or feel like life or to feel like life revolves around CF and treatments. So the general code there was mental health conditions and disorders, and then specifically the sub subcategory of resilience as a mental health condition, a positive condition, um, specific codes of risk and protective factors, parenting style, living with CF with the subcode of treatment burden under living with CF, and then populations and setting both child and parent. So you see how kind of one statement can break down into something uh, fairly complex. As I said, we had three wonderful teams with uh, each led by one CF researcher and two community member partners. Um, we coded over 3,000 items in total. Um, this took a while. Um, and uh, if you take away the COVID-19 questions, which we prioritized, um, you know, getting out there first, we had over 2,000 items uh, to code based on these first two questions that we pooled. Um, each team coded the first 20% of their assigned items by consensus. So again, this was really the fun part. Let's talk this through. What do, what do you think this means? Do we have the code book right? You know, is there anything else we need to tweak? And then after that, we were able to work independently so that of the group of three, two people would code any of the remaining 80 items in their pool. And we calculated inter rater agreement, which was really you know, quite good, ranging between 72 and 90%. And then every single item was reconciled um, so that we could do some statistical analysis. And I'll show you that in a minute. But we did two-sided tests with correction for the you know, many comparisons that we did. Uh, so we tried to make it a little bit more rigorous. And these are our demographics. So we had you know, 3,000 responses, but based on 841 people who um, took the time to complete some of the open-ended questions, um, providers, caregivers, adults with CF being the most um, frequent. And so those were the ones we were really able to use for the statistical analysis because they were large enough numbers. Um, and so you'll see actually we have a fairly um, even or good distribution of age of the people with CF or age of the children of a parent um, of FEV1 of people with advanced disease or, well, in this case, I'm not really showing advanced disease, but kind of really good lung function or maybe not so great lung function. Um, we have a good representation of people with transplant. We had a predominance of females um, replying to this. And um, this is, you know, coming up in multiple settings. This came up with our CFCBT trial. We've done a better job going from pilot to randomized trial of including men and recruiting men for the trial. And we want to do an even better job in our implementation trial to try to make sure that men with CF are um, thinking that mental health is something that's OK to talk about and to um, even have some preventative care for. OK, so these are the results, uh, the kind of really broad, um, large-scale results, um, top-line results. And we had, um, again, very strong agreement between the CF community members and the providers. Um, and the most common priorities across all the respondents by frequency were mental health conditions. So you see this in the different bubbles. The size of the bubbles are representing how many responses there were. So for mental health conditions, it was 579. That's the big bubble. The smallest bubble is effective modulators. That was 123 responses. And so you kind of see as it, as it goes uh, counterclockwise the, the range of um, of the frequencies. And within those bubbles, you're seeing um, the, some of the subtopics. So um, for example, for screening, uh, for screening, assessment, and intervention, the vast mo majority of people who mentioned that category, it was about interventions. We need interventions. Um, so mental health conditions, interventions, living with CF, systems level barriers and facilitators, and effects of modulators. Okay, and so we did look at some differences by respondent type. 
And there were some significant differences in mentioning some of those general codes. So um, providers and adults with CF were more likely to be concerned about the effects of modulators on mental health than were um, parent caregivers or uh, other, other caregivers. Systems level barriers and facilitators were more likely to be um, considered a priority by healthcare providers than by the caregivers. Living with CF, um, adults with CF, this makes sense. People having to deal with CF personally, adults with CF and their family members were more likely to mention items that were related to the experience of living with CF than were healthcare providers. But providers were more likely to mention some specific mental health conditions. So providers were more likely to mention body image and disordered eating, similar to what we saw in the quantitative data that I mentioned earlier. Providers were more likely to talk about procedural anxiety as a research priority, and also substance misuse as a research priority. On the other hand, community members were more likely to mention some other conditions that maybe tells us that as healthcare providers, we're, maybe we're not, this is not top of mind enough for us, and those were stress and trauma. We also looked at differences by respondent characteristics. So for mental health conditions and disorders, um, Adults with CF who either were planning to have a transplant or had had a lung transplantation were more likely to mention overall some sort of mental health condition as a research priority, which makes sense because we know that people who are post-transplant, for example, are at a high risk for a variety of mental health conditions, uh, PTSD, anxiety, depression, but also specifically, um, in this case, sleep came out as individually also significant. Mm -hmm. Caregivers of adolescents were less likely to mention mental health conditions. And as we know from the TIDES data, if Alexandra had shown you, you know, the slide of, of that data, we see the prevalence of anxiety and depression increasing from adolescence into adulthood. So again, that kind of makes some intuitive sense to me. Um, women and adults with CF who were um, on the older side, 56 and above, were more likely specifically to mention grief. Um, again, that may be something we're not thinking and talking about enough. Um, and in terms of systems level barriers and facilitators, so what do we mean by systems level barriers and facilitators? That's access to care, insurance, benefits, socioeconomic um, status uh, concerns. So caregivers of adults uh, or of children with a lower FEV1 were more likely to mention that they're running into systems level barriers. And that makes sense. They're probably having more contact um, with, um, with the healthcare system and maybe running into more trouble with it. Um, similarly, older adults with CF were also more likely to mention system levels barriers. Um, and for interventions, caregivers of adults, so um, spouses or, or parents of an adult, were more likely to mention the need for interventions than caregivers of seven to 11 year olds, which again may have to do with that increasing prevalence over time, particularly if we're not preventing or mitigating you know, these mild cases that might, might progress, um, then uh, becomes more of a need. There were no notable differences by lung function, by the way, in people with CF. So the idea that um, you know it must be hard, your mental health must be worse if you have advanced disease or you must be more concerned, um, that's not necessarily the case. So in conclusion, we did a qualitative analysis of a large survey of multiple stakeholders who provided input on the top research priorities for CF mental health. The respondents noted um, varied concerns, uh, really very rich data. We're showing you, you know, the very top line data here, but captured by a range of codes, mental health conditions like anxiety, depression, stress, trauma, resilience, the need for research on mental health interventions, the need to better understand the experience of living with CF, um, the need to better understand the health healthcare system barriers and facilitators and, and solve some of these problems. Uh, through researching what works, access to care, and the impact of CFTR modulators on mental health. And so this facilitated consideration of these diverse pers um, perspectives that helped, um, helped us identify gaps and select the areas of focus for future research. And I will end there. Any questions? Thank you so much for another um, really excellent talk and just really neat to see the richness in that qualitative data. Um, a question came through the app about any plans to ask um, adolescents or children directly about their research priorities or, or how the foundation maybe thinks about that. Yeah, I think that's really an excellent idea. There are more kind of logistical and permissions issues with doing that, but I think that's you know something to continue to um, to discuss with the foundation, how do we talk to, even how do we talk to children directly about um, their needs and their priorities? Um, 
that's one thing in our primary palliative care initiative. Um, there's, we have uh, primary palliative care screening starting at age 12, just like we have um, depression and anxiety screening to starting at age 12. But for the younger kids, we developed a discussion guide so we could be talking to kids directly about what are their experiences, what questions do they have about CF, what things are important to them, and we're happy to share that as well, the ADAPT CF. But you're right, you know, the, we, we need to know what, what's important to younger folks, um, hearing it from them, not just from their, their parent proxy. Yeah, that, a, a great question. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see how much qualitative data comes in. And then when you hear, you know, 3,000 codes, the understatement of the century, that that takes a long time. How do you um, synthesize data like this? How do you make decisions about what to focus on and what, what kinds of proposals to fund? Uh, Right. So, I mean, the good news is um, Enid Aliash, who, um, you know, may not be here, but he's a statistician for the CF Foundation. He was our partner on this study. He is ama an amazing wizard. He made that beautiful um, design with all of the circles yeah. for us. And he developed this kind of database where you can click in and drill down on different things. Um, and that will be, um, you know, once, once the results are published, uh, my understanding is that that will be made available to researchers who might have an interest in kind of looking at it and seeing what's there and, and you know, what else uh, that might generate for us. Um, but that is really an excellent question. How can you possibly, in, you know, in 3,000 words, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> synthesize 3,000 snippets of, um, of thoughts uh, and, and really thoughtful comments from the CF community and healthcare providers? And as you said the word publish, a question came in about plans to publish the qualitative data and when it might be available. <laughs> yeah, that is a really excellent question, and um, that is a priority um, for us to, um, now that we've been able to uh, finish coding and do this top line analysis to get out there um, several things. One will be um, a more detailed paper looking at those um, mental health areas of focus that I didn't talk about, right? Those, if you, if you look at the website, it'll be, you'll see little paragraphs about each of those sections. And, you know, our, the mental health advisory committee and folks who helped us with that, um, it was a little painful to have, have done a huge amount of work and then have it condensed into a little paragraph, right? And so what we would like to do yeah. is, is now update, you know, update those literature reviews and publish, um, you know, a white paper that really kind of substantiates where are we and where are the gaps. We also would like to get the quantitative results um, out there from this um, community and provider survey and also the qualitative results. And so we are going to be working as fast as we can to do those things. <laughs> Yeah, in your in your spare time. In our spare um, time yeah. <laughs> um, just one last question through the app, just about um, the the trauma code specifically, and if there's a sense if that is related to medical trauma, uh, connected to CF, or maybe more general. Um, I think both kinds of codes came out, um, or both both kinds of concerns came out in the qualitative um, piece. Um, I'm not sure that we. Uh, it, that'll be something we could go back to and try to look at how much was which. I don't think we specifically split that out as um, as one of our um, um, tags. But um, as as I just kind of recall what I've seen, for sure, medical traumatic stress came up, and for sure, there are other kinds of trauma that people experience um, that also can then potentiate the experience of medical traumatic stress and other kinds of, um, of trauma. So it can be a vicious cycle. Yes, Alexandra. Yes. I think you might want to mention um, our, our recent success that we could now develop a tool to assess comorbidities and the impact of that Yes, that's a really excellent um, point, Alexandra. During this meeting, we did hear that we um, have funding um, to proceed with developing a CF-specific mental health screener that will be a general mental health screener. So um, we'll not just be covering the PHQ-9 GAD-7, depression and anxiety, but that we'll be doing um, a, uh, a large amount of um, qualitative work, focus groups, um, some quantitative testing, some cognitive testing with people with CF, um, starting with the adults um, to see what is it that we're missing here and what can we put into a short screener that's feasible for you so we can be picking up things like trauma, um, procedural anxiety, substance misuse, um, eating, uh, disordered eating patterns, um, cognitive complaints that could be from ADHD or might be uh, modulator side effects, right? So um, if folks have ideas about what you would love to see in a general mental health screener, we'd love to, you know, hear that from you um, as well. Anything else you'd like me to say about that, Alexander? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so right, much thank again, you. Anna. Okay, 
Okay, next up we have Dr. Carolyn Snell, um, who's going to be talking to us about a uh, the CF stress questionnaire. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm Carolyn Snell. I'm a psychologist at Boston Children's Hospital, um, where I work in our pediatric CF program as well as in our adult CF program that is joint with Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and um, before we, um, sorry about that. And before we move forward today, I did just want to disclose that the later stages of this project are funded by a pilot and feasibility award from the CF Foundation. Um, so I'm very excited today to be um, talking with you about uh, development and validation of um, a CF-specific measure of perceived stress that we have been working on. Um, um, and so I'm going to be presenting the beginning and middle stages of our efforts to develop this questionnaire. Um, and so by way of background, um, you know, as all of us know, right, um, the CF Foundation recommends an annual mental health screening with the PHQ-9 and GAD-7. And we as a CF center have, of course, found this to be very helpful, as everyone has, in identifying a, a clinical population that is in need of services. Um, we also see at our center, though, that there seems to be a broader group of people who perhaps are not experiencing clinically significant anxiety or depression but they're coming in and they're saying they're stressed by high treatment burden, by feelings of maybe being powerless in the face of, the, in the face of their disease, um, facing high costs, um, and other stressors that are specifically associated with their CF care. Um, and so we looked to the literature, and what we found was that um, actually there's a pretty robust uh, literature out there on illness-specific distress in some other illness populations, um, and that that distress is actually a stronger predictor of daily functioning than depression alone. So it seems to be adding something to our understanding of the mental health um, of people with chronic illness. Um, we also uh, looked to the literature to find a theoretical framework for this, and um, we came upon the idea of perceived stress. Um, the definition of which is the degree to which events are assessed as stressful, unpredictable, or uncontrollable. So it's both the stressors themselves and the person's appraisal of those stressors that we're looking to uh, measure. So we sought here to develop the CF stress questionnaire as a reliable and valid measure that could extend and improve existing mental health screening. Um, and we also really wanted to use it as, uh, be able to use it as a tool to have discussions with people with CF about topics that were important to them related to their disease. Um, and so it was very important to us in this process that we create a tool with a lot of rounds of input from people with CF themselves. Um, and so it was very heartening to hear in the previous talk that um, stress is actually a research priority for people with CF, which suggests we're headed in the right direction, perhaps. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking about, uh, I'm going to be speaking briefly about some previous work that we did adapting an existing measure uh, to CF. Um, but I'm going to be focusing on a pilot validation study that we conducted um, and showing some uh, psychometric characteristics from that. Um, and then also um, focusing on um, what I'm going to refer to as study two here, which is um, our cognitive interviews in which we gathered uh, detailed feedback from people with CF. Um, so, in terms of the CFSQ structure, um, so we based the measure off of a measure that exists in the diabetes literature that's called the Diabetes Distress Scale. Um, this is widely used in that population as, a, in our center at least, an adjunct to uh, traditional mental health screeners like the PHQ-9, GAD-7. Um, and it, it has subscales of emotional burden, physician-related distress, regimen-related distress, and interpersonal distress. Um, and so, uh, our first adapted CFSQ um, had four subscales that were paralleling that. Um, and in addition to wanting to build off of these existing measures that have good research support, though, we really wanted to make sure that we were capturing the specific illness experience of CF, which is, of course, different than diabetes. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we added three subscales um, based on feedback, uh, again, from that previous study, um, looking at powerlessness, functional impairment, and economic burden. <laughs> So here are just some sample items from the CFSQ. Um, 
So for example, uh, for emotion, this emotional burden subscale, we might um, see feeling overwhelmed by the demands of living with CF. Um, for regimen-related burden, feeling like I don't do my airway clearance frequently enough. Economic burden, feeling overwhelmed by managing insurance issues. Um, so a wide range of um, CF-related stressors. Um, and, you know, in, in doing this, we really sought not just to capture the person who has major depressive disorder or, or generalized anxiety, which the, you know, which the GAD7 and PHQ9 do well. Um, we also wanted to capture people who, you know, like my patient who's a college student who says, I have to choose between my CF health and my social life. Um, I assume school and sleep fit in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or my patient who says she needs a personal assistant to manage all of the specialty pharmacies and insurance issues that she has to deal with. Um, or yet a third one who is not on a modulator who's saying he's overwhelmed by having to do hours of treatment every single day for his CF. And so this encompasses or it, it seeks to encompass all of those types of concerns. So in, in the uh, pilot validation study, which I'll refer to as study one, um, we had 30 adults with CF um, and they also completed the PHQ-9 and GAD-7 in addition to the um, pilot version of the CFSQ. Um, and so we were able to um, look at internal consistency as well as convergent validity. Um, and on an exploratory basis, we looked at the sensitivity of um, the CFSQ relative to the PHQ-9 and GAD-7. Um, oops, sorry, how do I go back? Um, and then um, I'm also going to speak about um, what I'm referring to as study two, which is where we conducted 25 detailed cognitive interviews with people with CF over Zoom. Um, and I'll get into more detail in terms of the methodology, but we got de detailed feedback on content and wording um, that we then used to create a revised version of the questionnaire. Um, so in terms of our pilot validation study one, um, so our demographics showed that um, the average age of our participants was in the mid-30s. We had slightly more women and there was a broad range of lung function represented. Um, in terms of internal consistency, um, results of the item and subscale level data from the pilot um, generally suggested that internal consistency was good. Um, the Kronbach's alpha for that, that's the statistic you see there, um, it shows that um, most of those scales are um, falling above the, cut, the cutoff that is generally um, seen as acceptable of 0.7, um, with only one of them, uh, interpersonal distress, falling just short of that. Um, and um, in addition, um, it's worth noting in terms of fact, uh, in terms of the structure of the measure that um, we did see some significant floor effects. Floor effects are when everyone um, or many people either endorse uh, the highest or the lowest item on a scale. Um, and so we saw that for um, physician-related burden and interpersonal distress, um, that people were really reporting very low distress. Um, and so, we, you know, we thought that was interesting and we saw, uh, we asked people with CF in later phases of the study, well, does that mean we should cut this subscale if, you know, not a lot of people are saying that they have this issue. Um, and people overwhelmingly said no. Um, if, this, if these issues are coming up, they're really important to capture, so we should keep it. So we kept these scales in. Um, we were also able to look at correlations between the CFSQ as well as its subscales um, and the PHQ-9 and GAD-7. So those statistics are for the CFSQ as a whole, um, correlations to the PHQ-9 and GAD-7 respectively. Um, and as we would expect, we see a higher correlation with anxiety since this is a measure of perceived stress. Um, we also, um, again, on an exploratory basis, were able to do a chi-squared test in which we were comparing the relative sensitivity of the CFSQ versus the PHQ-9 and GAD-7, um, rem remembering that we're wanting to capture this broader group of people with the measure. Um, and so um, we used uh, the clinical cutoff that was established for the diabetes scale, um, and then we used the clinical cutoffs for the PHQ-9 and GAD-7 and looked at how many people were captured by each. Um, and we found that the results of this were highly statistically significant. Um, where in our particular small sample of 30, um, we saw that PHQ-9 and GAD-7 each identified three people, whereas 10 additional people were um, reporting clinically significant CF-related stress um, that were not picked up by the mental health screening measures. Um, so again, exploratory, but suggests that we're, um, you know, perhaps targeting the group that we're looking for. 
Um, and then in terms of study two, um, we did cognitive interviews, um, as I said, with 25 uh, people with CF over Zoom. Um, each was an hour long, and we really went through with a fine-toothed comb um, the wording of each question. You know, what does this word mean to you? Um, is there a better way to phrase that? Um, you know, is this important and relevant to you? Um, and so we went through every item with people and did this. Um, and we did it in an iterative process. So. Um, you know, we would um, get, do some interviews, gather some feedback, make some revisions, do some more interviews, et cetera. Um, and we actually ended up adding a few more than we planned because we were getting so much really rich uh, feedback from people with CF who were actually enthusiastic to participate in this. Um, and the interviewers also were um, three uh, mental health clinicians in CF, two social workers and a psychologist. Um, and so we developed consensus, and um, these were the changes that we made. Um, so in, in general, the participants, you know, we got good results from um, when we asked about relevance and um, people said it was relevant and important to respect to their experience with CF. Um, we also, we added three items in response to the feedback we got. One about um, anxiety associated with getting PFTs and those results. Um, one about the impact of CF on relationships and one about uh, managing CF-related diabetes if that was uh, something going on for that individual. Um, and then we changed a little bit of wording and um, eliminated two items that people thought were either a little bit harshly worded or not uh, relevant to everyone. Um, and so here you can see um, a little screenshot of um, part of our completed measures. So um, like the PHQ-9 and GAD-7, um, this is looking at the past two weeks, um, and we have people answer, um, in this case, on a one to five Likert scale for each item. Um, and so in conclusion, um, we, we sought to develop a questionnaire that can extend and improve mental health screening. Um, we want to be able to identify people who have CF-specific stress, um, have important clinical conversations with them, hopefully, once we're more widely using this measure, and ultimately be able to use this measure to predict and improve daily functioning in people with CF, um, since it's associated with that. Um, and so, uh, you know, our preliminary results suggest that this is promising, um, and so we are excited. Um, that in the next phase of the study, um, we are currently doing a uh, multi-site validation study with 200 adults with CF um, across three geographically diverse centers. Um, and we are going to be able to look at some additional things um, beyond the pilot. So we'll be able to look at test-retest reliability, known group differences, and convergence with additional measures relevant to mental health, um, such as the CFQR. Um, and so we hope to have our data collected by the end of the year and to have um, the measure available hopefully in spring or summer. Um, I just wanted to thank um, our wonderful team um, who are working with us on all the different stages of this project, um, in particular our research coordinators, our biostatisticians, um, my center directors, Drs. Euler and Sawicki, who have been overseeing this project, um, as well as our wonderful collaborators at the University of Buffalo, the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and uh, Chalk Children's um, in California. Um, and be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we've, we have a couple questions through the app and please feel free to keep um, submitting for Dr. Snell. Um, a question about if you foresee um, using this eventually with a pediatric population or adapting for caregivers. That's a great question. Um, I had not actually thought about adapting it for, if, if caregivers, but that's a really good thought. Um, I do hope to be able to um, look at it with adolescents and to see if um, it has good psychometric properties with that population as well and, and make any adaptation that we need to to make it more age appropriate for that population for sure. Um, great. So uh, a question um, just came in also about um, any thoughts you might have about uh, solutions related to the high amounts of stress that, that might be reported due to treatment burden or disease activity? Yeah, that's a great question, because if you're going to ask about something, you'd better have a way to respond to what you find, right? Um, and so, you know, I think with this particular measure, uh, you, you know, depending on which subscales are getting endorsed, different uh, interventions might be warranted, right? And so if people are reporting high economic burden, perhaps that's somebody who really needs to talk with social work in more detail about some of those issues related to insurance and other things. Um, if somebody is reporting, you know, high sense of powerlessness and um, emotional burden, then perhaps that's somebody who we'd refer to outpatient therapy with, you know, psychologists or, or social work or others. Um, so we are thinking about what we will do beyond um, beyond this measure to uh, to intervene, but um, it probably is going to be pretty individually tailored. 
Great. Um, and this this is a question maybe generalizing beyond um, this specific measure, but you know, as we've been hearing so much at the conference about studies to look at um, removing treatments or ways to hopefully you know reduce the treatment burden. I guess how you know how do you see a questionnaire like this adapting to a changing disease context, or how do we kind of evolve our measurement as the clinical targets change? Yeah, it is such a moving target. And I mean, even, um, you know, we started developing this measure, I think, in 2018, right? And like so much has changed even since then in our world and in the world of CF. Um, so, um, no, I, I mean, I see, I see this as something that would probably need to be, you know, adapted every, you know, several years or something like that, as it were, if there was a major change in CF care. Um, but what I think is really great is that, you know, measures like this could hopefully see, you know, help us see if, you know, when people are withdrawing from therapies, does that decrease their, you know, regimen really? Related to stress, does that you know affect other areas of their um, illness-related stress? Great. Any other questions for Dr. Snell at this time? Yeah. That's a great question. So it's um, it's right now a 32-item survey, and so um, we tell people that it would take maybe like you know 15 minutes to complete or something like that. But um, usually, usually people do it significantly faster than that. Um, and a, a question came through about the, the next step, the multi-site RCT, um, and if there are any plans to look at how this CF-specific questionnaire might compare to more widely used stress measures, um, like the perceived stress scale, as an example. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, we've we've invested in this, you know, illness-specific stress construct, but I think that you know, more general life stress is obviously really important and is an overlapping construct. And so, um, while we didn't do it in our um, multi-site validation study, I think an interesting future direction would be to see to what extent does this correlate with perceived stress in, in general in life um, and not just related to CF. Um, and I, uh, questions keep coming in, which is great. Um, it, it, do you have a sense or, or thoughts about if um, the subscales can be looked at separately or is it recommended um, that, that this is just administered as an aggregate measure? I guess the, the question is about scoring and how to interpret individual scales. Sure. I mean, I think that we're, you know, we're looking to use the measure as a way to sort of cast a broad net and capture a lot of different mm -hmm. issues. And so um, the way that I would foresee it would be to in include all of the subscales so that you could see where somebody was coming up. Uh, an interesting use of it, though, might be if there was one subscale where someone was really high to be able to sort of re-measure yeah. uh, later, re-screen, and see if that particular subscale is, is declining, and I could see doing that. Great. Okay, thanks again. Thank uh, really interesting work, thank you. Okay. So up next we have uh, Olivia Stransky, who's gonna be talking about uh, photo voice exploration of parenthood in CF. Hi everyone. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Olivia Stransky. Uh, it's really exciting to hear everyone else's work and see how it connects to stuff that I've heard from the participants in our study. So I'm here to talk to you about uh, our photo voice project. Real quick, if you're taking notes or if you're good at remembering numbers, remember the number 108. Mm -hmm. It's very important that you remember that number. So I have no disclosures. All right, so for some background, approximately four out of five young men and women with CF desire future children. We've all seen the numbers. We know pregnancies are increasing. Um, and prior studies have shown that people with CF have unique concerns regarding balancing CF and parenthood. So photo voice. Um, this is uh, a community-based participatory research method uh, developed in the late 1990s, uh, which has three goals. The first is to enable people to record and reflect on their strengths and concerns around a topic, to promote critical dialogue and knowledge about important concerns through large and small discussion of photographs, and to reach policymakers and other change agents to affect change or growth. The third step is the goal of today's presentation, to bring the perspective and experiences of the participants to all of you here at NACFC. So how photo voice works. So the first step, Participants as a group brainstorm uh, to generate research questions. The step two is photography exploration, which is done outside of the study sessions. The third step is the showed method and feedback. You can see the showed method questionnaire on the right. 
Uh, the fourth, uh, participant-led thematic analysis of the photographs and the conversations that are had about the photographs. And finally, presentation of results to community members, leaders, and change makers, which is all of you. Um, so again, participants decide as a group what they're going to explore. They explore it. They conduct analysis based on what they are seeing. Um, and then we're responsible for sharing that. Um, and just as a note, the full uh, results are on display outside of room 108. Um, there is a full gallery set up there, big, beautiful printed photos that I highly encourage you to all go see and spend your time with, especially as we may have to rush through some of them today. So recruitment, the study was deemed exempt by the University of Pittsburgh IRB. Uh, participants were recruited from CF centers at UPMC and National Jewish Medical Center and the CFF Community Voice Listserv. And I just want to take a quick second to give a special thanks to the CFF Community Voice Program. It helped us connect with people across the country who were interested in participating in our work. If you're a person with CF or a caregiver of someone with CF, it's a great way to get involved with and influence research. If you're a researcher, it's a great way to recruit beyond your immediate um, clinic population. Um, I have contact information for them if you're interested in working with them. I, I really recommend it. So uh, people were eligible if they had a confirmed diagnosis of CF and they were parent to at least one child under 10 years of age. Participants were compensated $50 for each meeting they attended. So we had 18 parents participate. A number of children ranged from one to four. Um, two participants had previously undergone lung transplants and 14 were currently taking a highly effective modulator therapy. So again, uh, so due to CF infection control, all meetings were held via Zoom. Uh, in order to elicit maximum participation, we divided them into three cohorts, an 18-person Zoom meeting. You're not going to get everyone talking. <laughs> um, each cohort began with an introductory meeting explaining the goals of photo voice as well as introductions. Uh, all participants were given an account on 23 Snaps, which is this uh, photo sharing app that was designed to maximize uh, privacy and security. We wanted everyone to feel safe sh sharing these photos of themselves and of their children. Uh, and all cohorts were given the same initial photography prompt. So real quick, these are the prompts that were generated by each cohort. So the first question at the top, what is it like for you to be a parent? Everyone had that. Mm -hmm. Below that are the um, prompts that each cohort generated as a group. Um, I know that I'll give you a minute to take a look. I can't read through all of them. Um, but you can see it's a really broad range of concerns, um, and questions. All right, so let's take a look at the thematic results. After they answered these questions, they looked at their, at their photos and they said, what are the themes here we're seeing among all of them? So cohort one, joy. Uh, it's appropriate that this is the first theme because all participants overwhelmingly talked about what a beautiful thing it was for them to be a parent. Um, so we can see uh, on the first, uh, we have a participant showing her son her trichafta. Mm -hmm. Parenting with CF means that advancements in CF care are advancements for the whole family. Uh, then we have teaching my baby how to have fun in the everyday. And then we have playing drums in a local band while having a pick line in my arm. The doctor said it was not a good idea to continue playing. I said it's not an option to stop for my quality of life, so let's figure out a way to make it work. This was the mm -hmm. second one I had put in after the first one failed. It was worth every inconvenience. Mm -hmm. A juxtaposition of emotions. Fishing with my daughter lost in the moment for me, one of the times when I'm not thinking about CF and my mortality. Most of the time I'm constantly thinking about how much longer I have with my daughter, when the next hemoptysis episode will be, or about which medicine I forgot to take in the day. Bittersweet, the joy of having my son visit me, juxtaposed with the sadness of needing to be apart. I can't read the last one, it's quite long, but again, room, uh, outside of room 108. Striving for balance, juggling multiple balls and sometimes dropping one. Family life with CF includes treatment time and self-care activities as a regular part of everyone's routine. And I want to spend a special moment on this photo. Um, so you can read the caption. I just want to say she's doing her exercise, she's doing her vest, and she's doing her inhaled therapy at the same time. In the background, her five-year-old is on Zoom kindergarten, and she said her toddler was just there <laughs> in the room. Um, uncertainty. Um, so I'll just read the one on the right. The decision to become a parent and parenting is filled with tough choices. You must make long-term decisions with an uncertain future while only being able to look down a small part of the road ahead. 
Cohort two, prioritizing your own health. When I first became a mother, the guilt of not parenting like a normal parent set in quickly. My life isn't Pinterest worthy, my house isn't a page out of a magazine, and there are days when the best I can do is sit on the sidelines. Um, I have to remind myself it's okay to rest. It's okay to take time out of my day to prioritize my health. It's okay if our days look like this sometimes. We have resiliency. I am trying to live my best life I can, even though it may be hard for me to breathe, but I am trying to cherish the moments I have with my son, creating memories that will last a lifetime. And again, resiliency. There's too many, I can't read all of the captions. Room 108, guys. Um, multitasking. On a hike with my kids in the Rockies, getting exercise is critical for me to stay healthy in both mind and body, and getting the kids outside gives me a chance to be a parent and take care of myself at the same time. This is another great one. Um, and again, someone is, he's doing his vest and is inhaled while helping his uh, son work on his reading, and actually he noted that before doing the photo voice study, he had never done any of his care in front of his kids. And through seeing other people talk about doing it, he was inspired. He thought, I, I, I can do that. I, can, I, I don't have to close myself off when we're doing this. Um, so cohort three, prioritize your own health despite what your instincts and society tell you. I have learned that it's better, even though we have all this mom guilt, it's so much better to take care of ourselves so that we can be better parents to our kids. When I was neglecting my own health, I was doing a disservice to both of us. We had a lot of people who talked about needing to give their kid a, a nebulizer to play with. <laughs> Again, prioritizing your own health. Mom and son making the best of a CF ex ex bleh, <laughs> exacerbation hospital stay. Uh, hospital administration and care teams can work together on more flexible policies for visiting hours for our children. We're in the hospital for longer than the average patient and more frequently. We need to see our children and they need to see us. It's vital to our mental and physical health. Take breaks and vacations to enjoy life and don't be afraid to rely on support networks. It's important to enjoy life and all the little moments that can bring joy, especially when you have a chronic illness. I think people with CF should always try to fill up their bucket. Vacations are possible and far more enjoyable when you have friends and family to help and the support of a care team to ensure that you're properly equipped to make the trip. One of our participants talked about going camping and finding a battery-powered generator so that he could bring a mini fridge so that he could keep his medications cold. There's a lot of really amazing strategies parents have come up with. Combining CF care with spending time with your child can normalize it and make it easier to fit in. Parenting is a lot of juggling and er, juggling a lot of schedules and moving parts and meeting many demands of both CF and being a parent. I feel like when you go to clinic, sometimes they're very rigid about what they expect of you, and it's like when you're a parent and you have you have to have a little more flexibility. For me, that always stresses me out because I don't like being a bad patient. Again, this is a very long one. Um, Obviously, growing up with CF, being told you're not going to live to adulthood, being told you're not going to get to have all these experiences that you dream of, it makes you so much more grateful and appreciative for these moments. I think it was a combination of the contrast between this making me so happy and then just being so grateful to be able to have a child and to be able to still be here today when the doctor said there was no way I would be. So this is the first study to use the photo voice methodology to understand the experiences of people with cystic fibrosis. I would love, if you think that photo voice might be a good fit for some qualitative work, I would love to talk to you about it. I think it's a great tool. It is vital to point out while parents with CF experience unique challenges, it is such a joyful and affirming experience for them. Um, and the perspectives collected by this research should be used to guide future interventions and research, and again, Room 108, that's where the gallery is. I'm also hoping to get this online so that um, people with CF can also access. That's something we're working on. So thank you to the community partners who made this possible. Amanda, Ryan, Leisha, Stacy, Kristen, Chris, Eric, 
Melanie, Jessica, Jessica, Mary Lee, Brian, Doug, Whitney, Abby, Robert, Joe, Lauren, and uh, John. Thank you also to Dr. Tracy Kazmersky, who is currently presenting on parenting in a different room. Um, <laughs> Dr. Patricia Document, Dr. Jennifer Taylor Kauser, Molly Pam Menopal, Jessica Hudson, and Christina Roman at Community Voice and Photo Voice Worldwide, who trained me in uh, the facilitation process. My citations. And then I just want to say, um, for the safety of our presenters and attendees, I urge the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation to commit to ensuring that future meetings are held in locations where elected leaders understand the importance of reproductive freedom, gender-affirming care, the right to vote, and the sanctity of the physician-patient relationship. Wow, <laughs> um, <laughs> getting a little like choked up looking yeah. at that. And you actually, um, you you went through that. You have a couple minutes if there right. were any pictures you yeah. wanted to go, go back, back to. Um, <laughs> and please send um, questions for Olivia um, into the app, or if anyone has questions or comments, um, why don't I stop talking for a minute and let everyone read that, and then we can uh, go into questions. My boyfriend told me to skip all the boring research stuff <laughs> to get to the good stuff, but I figured. <laughs> So the big thing was being in contact with other parents with CF. Uh, for a lot of them, it was the first time they'd ever talked to another parent who also had CF. Um, and that was huge. So, you know, I made sure that if people wanted to make their contact information available, it was shared with everyone else. Um, similarly, we did a, a study where we interviewed um, 38 parents with CF. We just did one-off qualitative interviews, and they really advocated for a uh, peer-to-peer support group. Um, to talk about parenting strategies, even just parenting experiences. Um, talk, just someone else to relate to. One woman talked about she has a nebulizer in her car, and she's worried that the other moms at her kid's school thinks that she vapes, um, and that they're judging her for vaping in the car before she gets her kid. Um, and just being able to like sh know that someone else out there like you know yes. deals with these same things. Yeah. So a parent support group might be one way. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's on our list. <laughs> And I know Peer Connect, I think, mm -hmm. exists, and so I'm wondering if a parenting-focused um, arm of that might be something to consider. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think you, you alluded to putting this uh, online, but a, a question came through about um, where or, or if the photo voice images can be viewed after the conference. Yeah, so we are trying to find a home for them online. Um, I would very much like if the CFF wanted to maybe host them online in a blog post. Um, we need to um, figure that out um, because, yeah, again, it's it's very important that it's not just shared with with care teams and researchers, but with members of the community. Um, yeah, yeah. I think a really nice uh, piggyback question on that is um, about about dissemination. So, how you disseminate um, results from a unique photo voice projects like this while still protecting um, confidentiality and privacy of the participants? Yeah, so everyone who participated, um, when we when we explain the study to people, we talk about the goal is that these photos are shared. Um, also, if, we, um, if they take a picture of another person, including their child, a release form has to be signed. Mm. Um, that said, if a parent ever does come back to me and says they're no longer comfortable having these the, a photo shared, I mean, I, I would pull it. Um, obviously with a paper, you know, the, the paper is the paper, you know, but, but for the purposes of display, yeah. Um, a, a question about um, how or, or if parents with CF can still enroll in the study. Is this work ongoing? Unfortunately, it's not. We wrapped it up. Um, I know that participants in it wanted to keep it going, just thought that the idea of a photo voice as just like an ongoing thing would be really great. Um, yeah, I, 
I think it should happen. I just don't know how. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I think it's it's clear that this is a, a very interesting topic. Mm -hmm. People are enthusiastic about it. Um, a couple of questions uh, came in about plans or ideas about extending to um, additional populations such as adolescents with CF. Um, I mean, I have so many ideas about <laughs> groups. I think that this would be really great to look at like relationship to food. I think it could be really interesting. I think it'd be really interesting to try and explore the experiences of racial and ethnic minorities, of gender minorities uh, in CF. Um, I think it would be really good for adolescent uh, mental health. It could be really interesting for looking at caregiver mm -hmm. experiences. I mean, it's it's a really good way of like finding it like a, a small subgroup within a larger group and giving them a space to sort of, with other people, figure out where do we want to go, what do we want to say. Yeah, someone asked um, a, a great question too about um, coming from a, a talk about communities of color in the, the CF population. Um, was there racial ethnic diversity in the study subjects? What, your thoughts about that? Yeah, so we had one participant who identified as multiracial and Hispanic. Um, our recruitment, um, you know, it was people who were interested uh, via CFF reached out to us. Um, I would love to, I, yeah, this this would be, it would be really great to have more um, racial and ethnic diversity in, in a study like this. Um, uh, I know at our clinic, it just, there was no one eligible Sure. Um. Um, I, I question, um, so not, not from the app, this is just uh, Kim's brain unloading on you, but um, if we think about, you know, a photo voice methodology um, and maybe similarities or differences with more traditional qualitative methodological mm -hmm. approaches, I'm just curious to hear a little more about, um, you know, what, what you think the benefits or unique strengths are, how it kind of integrates with the broader field of qualitative methodology. So I think that what's really interesting about it is again that the photography prompts, which I'll go back to because I know I yeah, didn't spend a lot of time on that, um, is that seeing what prompts they generate, that in itself is data to look at mm -hmm. and also it directs the research. So it's sort of a two for one in a sense, like to see what questions they, wa they want to know more about what the other people in the group think of these things, right? They want to know how do you navigate travel with your children in CF care and to know that they're interested in that and then to also get to see their own responses to it. I think makes it uh, really unique and really powerful. And again, it can sort of, yeah, if you already are wondering, I think this is a concern for the population, and then the population is saying, I want to know more about this. It, it, it really can help at least <laughs> make you feel like you're going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, a question about if um, you or, or maybe other researchers um, with expertise in photo voice um, consider evaluating it as an intervention in and of itself. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, like, as a, I think that would be interesting. Um, I don't. I don't know. I think. I mean, again, like I said, the participants did um, were interested in continuing the process, um, and and again, it sort of just ties into that creating a, a support group around a shared like aspect of of living with CF. So I think it could be an intervention. It would it would be interesting to see how long what that would look like on a long-term basis. Yeah. Great. Um, any other questions for Olivia? Were you guys going after this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not quite yet. Um, <laughs> thank you. Really, really interesting. Um, So we have um, one more really great talk queued up. Um, Dr. Vaziri, who's a pediatric pulmonology fellow, um, talking to us about uh, it, it's time to be blunt in investigation of attitudes and usage of, of cannabis and vaping. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to present what I've been working on for this past year. So my project focuses on the attitudes and usage of cannabis and vaping in the CF community. I think this is an area that really needs to be studied more, and I hope with my research I'll be able to make a case for it. Oh, I forgot. I have no disclosures. In 1970, marijuana was classified as a Schedule I drug. 
meaning it was completely illegal and had no recognized medical use. For decades, this view persisted and set back research for years. Today, more and more states are recognizing that marijuana has therapeutic benefits, and many have actually legalized use or they're moving in that direction. Right now, there are a total of 37 states in Washington, D.C. that allow for the use of marijuana for medical purposes. And of those, 19 and the district allow for recreational use. And as more states continue to legalize marijuana, there has been increased public support and interest. These are the results from the most recent Gallup poll. And as you can see, over the past few decades, the number of those who support legalization has been rising with a record high of 68% in 2021. And there's also a very similar trend in those who have tried marijuana. You can see here that almost 50% of those surveyed have tried it within their lifetime. So more people are now turning to cannabis for a variety of reasons. Some of them use it to alleviate mild health conditions, and some even use it to address the symptoms that come with having a chronic disease. So of course, I was really interested to see what the trends are in those with CF. And I found only one prior study in the last decade which looked at prevalence. So they surveyed participants in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and what's really important to know is at that time, there were no legal medical marijuana laws for CF patients in both of those states. So their results showed that 16.5% have reported using marijuana in their lifetime, with 15.4% reported using within this past year. And the number I found most interesting was that 46% of those surveyed would be interested in trying marijuana if it was legally available. So to me, the biggest takeaway of this study was that there's a lot of interest within the CF community with trying mar marijuana. Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, which is also seen here. So these are some of the screenshots of the questions and advice I found online. Some of them good, some of them bad, and some of them very concerning. And this is just a fraction of what I found. So there's a lot of confusion and a lot of misconceptions within the CF community. So before I get started talking about my study, I do want to define some terms. In the study, I distinguish between marijuana and CBD, so I want to go through the differences. The cannabis plant contains many chemical compounds called cannabinoids. The two most well-known cannabinoids are THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, which is cannabidiol. THC is psychoactive and known to give you that well-known high, while CBD is not as psychoactive, and studies have shown that it can give you some anti-anxiolytic and some anti-inflammatory effects. So when I'm discussing marijuana, also known as cannabis, I'm referring to products that have both THC and CBD in it. And there are a lot of CBD products on the market right now, but legal CBD products must contain less than 0.3% of THC. So the goals of my study were to understand the prevalence of cannabis and e-cigarette use in CF participants who are 13 years of age and older, determine whether there are any demographic or social factors that are associated with usage, and then last, explore patient perception of their CF healthcare team's understanding of cannabis and vaping. Our inclusion criteria included those who are 13 years of age and older, who have cystic fibrosis and are English speaking. This is a cross-sectional one-time study that took place on REDCap. And recruitment took place through several different means. We distributed this on the CF listserv, and it was also on CF Voices. I also recruited through closed membership CF Facebook groups and did some internal recruitment through our own program. So of the 214 subjects who met our inclusion criteria, our age range was between 13 to 80 years old with a mean age of 34. The survey was more female predominant. And the majority of those who took the survey were non-Hispanic white. In terms of location, the states in the blue were those who participated, so we had a pretty nice distribution throughout. So the first question participants were asked was if they have ever used or tried any of these substances, which is seen here in the gray. Of the three, more people have tried marijuana than CBD and vaping. These numbers are actually very similar to the national average of the total population who have ever tried these products, which is seen here in the dotted lines. And then current use, um, current users are characterized as those who have used within the last year, which is seen here in the blue. 
So what we found was that the majority of our participants in the survey have tried at least one of these substances within their lifetime, with about a quarter to a third being characterized as current users. So the next thing I wanted to characterize are the ways marijuana and CBD are used. We can see marijuana in the green and CBD in the yellow. With both of these substances, edibles are the most common route of administration. And surprisingly, we found that smoking was more common amongst those who use marijuana, and vaping was more common amongst those who use CBD. We also really wanted to see if there are any factors asso associated with current users. So one factor that really stood out to us was how current users rated their health. Participants were asked to rate their lung health from poor, which is seen here in the gray, and to excellent, which is seen here in the green. Those who are current users of marijuana were more likely to rate their lung health positively compared to non-users, although there was no statistical significance. Participants were also asked to report their latest lung function, specifically their forced expiratory volume, so their FEV1. Once again, there was no statistically significant difference noted for lung function when compared to non-users. However, we did find that current users of marijuana were more likely to rate their overall health more positively when compared to non-users, who are more likely to rate their overall health negatively. So what this data tells us is that even though current users of marijuana may not view their lungs as healthier, they do see themselves as healthier. And this may be due to several different factors, one of them being that marijuana, for some, can cause an improvement in mood, Many with chronic disease do use it to improve anxiety, improve depression, and relieve stress, so this may be contributing. And interestingly, the opposite was true for e-cigarette users. Current users who vape were more likely to have a poor perception of their overall health versus non-users. And a similar trend was again seen for lung health. Vaping users were more likely to have a poor perception of their lung health when compared to non-users. And then current vaping users are also more likely to have a self-reported FEV1 in the intermediate range, which is seen here in the yellow, when compared to non-users. So those with great lung function, which is seen here in the blue, and severe lung function seen in the burnt orange, or I guess orange here, don't seem to be vaping as much in comparison. So my theory on this is that those with poor lung function may have more inter interactions with the healthcare community, or they understand the risks of vaping with their decreased lung function. And those with great lung function just may be a little bit more health conscious. So I think what's really interesting here is that the majority of current vaping users, while reporting the intermediate lung function, have such a negative perception of their lung and overall health. So as we saw several slides ago, what we found, the numbers that we found were pretty revealing. They suggest that the CF community is trying these substances to a degree that's nearly equal to the total national average. So I think the question really becomes, what are we discussing with them in clinic? So the, while the majority of those surveyed stated that their team has asked about marijuana use, CBD is least commonly asked about, which is interesting now knowing that about a quarter of those surveyed who use CBD do use it via an inhalational means. Even less discuss the risks, side effects, and benefits, which is seen here in the green. Notably for marijuana and e-cigarettes, participants do feel that less than half of their healthcare teams have a discussion with them. So why aren't we having this, these discussions? Is it because of patient discomfort? And the answer is no. The majority of our participants actually did feel comfortable discussing all three substances, which is seen here in the yellow. But what I'm always wondering is if our patients are being truthful. So we did do a spin of this question and asked, how likely would you be to lie about use? Again, we can see here that the majority of those surveyed still feel comfortable discussing use with their team, which is denoted in the green. In the blue, we have those who wouldn't lie about use, but would lie about the amount that they were using. So we have almost a quarter of participants who fall into that category, meaning that if you do ask about use, almost a quarter may not be telling you the complete truth. And then we do have a small percentage of people who don't feel comfortable discussing use with their team, which is seen here in the gray, the highest noted for vaping. And the major issue for that discomfort was our medical records across all three substances. 
A lot of our participants didn't feel comfortable having usage on their medical record, and some of the reasons cited was because they felt that it, was, it would create issues with getting a transplant, it can create a liability, and there were several comments regarding provider knowledge being a factor. And so when asked to rate their provider's knowledge on these three substances from poor to excellent, almost a third of participants rate their provider's knowledge in the fair category across all three. And so this isn't a place where we should be satisfied being, considering, that, considering the prevalence of these substances within the CF community is pretty high. So after getting these results, my main takeaway is that our patients are using these substances, and from their perspective, we are not doing a great job keeping up with our education. I think increasing our knowledge regarding these substances may help our patients disclose information, understand the risks and benefits, and help them make the safer choice. So these are some resources that I find pretty helpful. UCLA has an incredible center for can cannabis and cannabinoids research, which is different lectures and information. OHSU also started this website to help us have these evidence-based discussions about cannabis use. I also always find informal education very helpful, mainly discussions with friends, discussion with patients, and I love going on the message boards. But I do feel like we're at this point where we need formal education and training regarding the uses of medical cannabis. We unfortunately do not get this in medical school, in residency, or even in fellowship, and this study, along with countless others, really demonstrates that there's a need. And I also wanted to briefly discuss transplant because it is a topic that has come up a lot from participants in this survey. We know that prevalence is high and patients may not be forthcoming due to concern it can exclude them from transplant. And their fears really aren't too far off. Some centers do have a zero tolerance policy, while some require a long time of abstaining pre and post transplant. And there doesn't seem to be a consensus among transplant centers on the correct approach to adopt with transplant candidates who do use cannabis. But we do know that many patients use it to alleviate pain, improve mood, appetite, and sleep, which are common in both pre-transplant and post-transplant populations. But of course, we know that inhaling any substance is bad, and there are adverse effects which have been reported with cannabis, including interactions with immunosuppressants, commonly used after transplant, risk of an infection, and concern for addiction. But I think clinician bias, lack of consensus, and a lack of research really limit standard decision making and worsen disparities in lung transplantation. Learning more about the interactions between cannabis and immunosuppressants and the association between usage and transplant survival will really help establish a standard evaluation process. There's such a stigma associated with use, and we won't move the field forward unless we do more research. I think bottom line, more states are going to continue to legalize cannabis and more people are going to continue to use. So while the regulations related to cannabis use are constantly evolving, developing a uniform set of guidelines, utilizing screening tools, and having educational materials would be very important, not only for providers, but also for our patients. That's it. I do have a few people to thank. Um, I'm so lucky to have such incredible mentors at UCSF. I do want to thank Dr. McGarry, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Cuneo. Um, I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't for them. And then I do want to th thank the CF Foundation for helping me with the first, uh, for providing me with the first and second year grant, um, and their incredible staff. Enid helped me with the survey. Paula, Lily, and Marissa helped with distribution. And then lastly, I do want to thank everyone who shared the survey with their patients. I'm understanding how difficult it is to share a survey, especially one without an incentive. And for that, I'm really thankful. That's it. Great, that was so interesting and a really important topic. And please um, submit any questions through the app. Um, I, I think it would be great to maybe hear you um, talk a little more about maybe how um, how can we be assessing use better in clinic and um, any thoughts about documentation. I mean, I think that's, it, it certainly makes sense that patients would be worried about what goes into the EHR. And yeah. I think, um, you know, as notes get more and more detailed, it's, it's hard sometimes to know what to put in and what, what not to. So I'm, I'm just curious if you have thoughts about talking about and then documenting. Yeah, I think usually just asking them about use. There are a couple of screening tools, like the, I think it's the CUDIT, which is the Cannabis Use Disorder yeah. 
test. I don't know what the I, I forget what the I stands for. So those are all helpful screening tools. And there's a cage screening tool also that I find pretty helpful. But usually I just start asking them about use, and they're usually pretty open, especially the teenagers. Um, and I think that's probably the first great step. And then documenting, I think it's very hard now that patients can see our notes. Mm -hmm. So it is a little bit difficult to document, and I don't have a great answer for that. Yeah, um, no, it is. I think it's rapidly evolving in, in lots of areas, and it's, yeah. it's important to, to know that. Um, a question came through about, uh, well, a, a comment and then the question that um, in, in this provider's clinic, um, there's some provider support for encouraging use of, of edible versus, versus inhaled cannabis if it's coming up. Um, and then a follow-up question about um, recommendations or whether it's appropriate, I think, for um, screening related to substance dependence when you're asking about recreational use, I guess, how you differentiate and um, what, what you might do to screen for dependence present or in the future. Yeah, I think those screening tools, so the CUDA um, is the Cannabis Use Disorder Screening. That one actually does um, look for like, screening disorders, and so does the CAGE. So I think going from mainly like how often they're using it, why they're using it, that's, those are all very important questions. And then just utilizing, I usually utilize those screening tools when I'm asking them questions. Great. Um, a question about if there, if there is clear scientific evidence um, for excluding individuals from lung transplants on the, on the basis of cannabis use. I didn't see anything. So I'd love to hear anyone who deals with lung transplantation um, to talk about this, because that's actually one of the things that mainly came up a lot in the comments. So a lot of people said that they were not forthcoming because of lung transplantation. They got a lot of benefit out of it. And I saw several case reports regarding immunosuppressants in cannabis use, but I didn't really see anything else. So I'd love to hear. I, yeah, that, and that's what I saw in terms of the case reports also. But I think being open about it with the patients, just telling them, because some transplant centers just tell them to abstain pre and post transplant and don't really go through their reasons. And that's why a lot of patients don't really disclose that use. So I think telling them that there is an interaction with immunosuppressants would be very helpful. Because um, there was actually a comment that said that they'd end up taking it and there was an issue, but they never knew. Um, yeah, another um, question I think related to potential medical um, impact. Uh, a question: If are you aware? Are you aware of any anti-inflammatory effects um, for CF patients who don't smoke or or vape, but who might be using um, edibles or other? Yeah, not that I know of. But I okay, I do think those would be great great studies. So I think that's exactly how we can move the field forward: is if we do start studying this more. Um, a question about the screening tools you measured and um, if those screening tools or other uh, standardized measures ask about um, reasons reasons for use. Yeah. Yeah, they ask for reasons for use because I think that's actually really important also. So we did ask about reasons for use, which I didn't include in, in the presentation. But a lot of people use cannabis for anxiety, depression, and sleep. So those mm. were the top three reasons for use throughout. Um, so do you think... And then, and then I ask them if they feel like it's improving it, if it's on the Likert scale, if they feel like it's making it worse or improving. And the majority said it helped them with their sleep a lot, with their anxiety a lot. Depression, actually, interestingly, a lot of people actually felt as if it made it a little bit worse. Mm. Yes, question. 
Yeah, we did ask them. So they actually require, so they say no, nothing inhaled, and I think that makes sense. And then um, they require, I think it's six months pre and post the transplant. Yeah. Oh, I didn't look at that, but that's a interesting. Yeah. Uh, actually, I am lying. We did ask about this, but we don't have the data. So we did ask about um, anxiety. So we did the, the PHQ-4, I think. So we asked those four questions that analyze anxiety and depression. So I'm analyzing that right now, actually, in comparison to usage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't. I thought about that after too. I, I didn't ask how many airway clearance treatments they're doing and if they're taking their. I did ask if they're taking their enzymes, but not about adherence. So. Mm. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you, and thanks to all the speakers. Really great session. <laughs>